Hi, welcome back to Power of Storytime. I'm Kate, the creative director of Calling Card Books, NZ Girls Press. And every Wednesday at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time, we read from one of our books. And we've been reading from Finding the Lost so far. Um, and also we wanted to say that if you're enjoying these, we'd love for you to share them with your friends who might also uh, want to watch them and uh, follow our page or subscribe to our page so you can catch all the new ones. And we are lucky enough today to be joined by the author, Michael Foster, who's going to answer some more questions. So thanks for joining us again, Michael. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy these. I never know what questions you're going to ask. It's always, it's always a surprise. Yeah, I try and I try and come up with some new and unique ones because I don't want, uh, don't want it to be too much. The and the burning question I have after last week is last week in the story, Alicia went to find Vulcan and was at these magical hot springs and, and remembered going there with her parents and dropping hot dogs into the boiling, you know, water and cooking them that way. And so I had to ask, have you done that in real life? And most importantly, what do hot dogs boiled in hot spring water taste like? Because I'm so intrigued now. <laughs> um, so to answer the first question, yes. And in fact, as recently as two years ago, I was with my daughter and her new husband. Um, and it was his first time visiting the cabin and the lake. And I said, well, we're going to have to go do this. The guy is wonderful. And his answer to everything, uh, every time I said, oh, we're going to go do this, he's like, sounds fun. <laughs> so <laughs> he, was, he was a good sport about everything. And, and we go there. And so to describe it a little bit, which I described in the, in the book, uh, I believe I described it fairly uh, accurately. But there's a lot of minerals coming out of the mm -hmm. ground in this, in this hard water that that's coming out of the ground and the minerals kind of build up around the edge. And in this section, they've created this trough that's, um, you know, four or five, five inches wide and fairly deep, maybe uh, eight inches deep or so. Uh, and it, it extends uh, three feet or something like that. Uh, and there are some rocks that uh, have fallen in the trough and they create kind of these pools that the water just bubbles out and rushes through. Um, and you just take your hot dogs and drop them in there and, and let them boil. <laughs> uh, and you also have to, of course, have a pair of tongs to get them out because the water is hot. <laughs> uh, now, do hot dogs float? Do they, do you, do you have to like oh, really no. fish them out? Or do they, I can't say I've ever boiled a hot dog before. They, they kind of, they kind of, various things and sometimes one will get over the edge and start going downstream <laughs> and chase Great out hot dog and try to you know catch it along the way yeah there um i can say they taste magical they taste like all the greatest things in the world uh <laughs> but honestly i i mean eating hot dogs boiled in an outdoor hot spring is just an amazing experience uh there's a sulfur, sulfur kind of smell in the air there because of all these natural hot springs. Um, so maybe that taints the flavor of the hot dog enough to, to take away the joy of just cooking and eating from nature. <laughs> it's part of the magic. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's wonderful. All you need is a little, uh, little mustard and you're good. Did you ever hot springs boil anything other than hot dogs? My foot. <laughs> oh no. Um, but yeah, funny, funny you should ask. Uh, I, I was um, probably seven or eight. Oh no. And uh, running around these, these hot springs being the free range child that I was, my parents, um, you know, let them play. They're off doing what they be careful, all this. Um, and I ended up accidentally stepping oh. in one of these hot springs. And uh, I, I thought I would get in trouble. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but it was, 
it was a pretty good burn and on the the hike back to the the car oh, it's gosh. you know 20 minutes half an hour uh from where you park to, to where you can get to the hot springs um on the hike back my parents noticed that i was limping and they asked mike did you hurt yourself what happened and we we eventually get back and i tell them they they take off my shoe and as they pull off my sock, some skin comes with it. Oh um, no! And, uh, yeah, it took uh, we bandaged, bandaged it up and it, uh, oh yeah, that gosh. was a uh, that was the only other thing that that we boiled in the Oz Springs unintentionally. Oh, that sounds horrifying. I guess you didn't have the the <laughs> scene like in the book where you got your foot in an icy cooler to make it stop. <laughs> The smart thing to do, but I was worried I was I would get in trouble because I was probably playing where they told me not to yeah. play. It's, it's it's little kid logic at its finest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness! Oh, I can't imagine. Um, now we're we're about to read a kind of one of the most scary parts in the entire series. Like the wolf attack earlier was was pretty scary, but. Um, we're about to meet Silver King, and that's kind of intense. And so I wanted to ask, how do you decide how intense or scary scenes are going to be, since it is kind of for a middle grade, a little bit younger audience? Um, it's tough. I, I, I want to go scary. Uh, I mentioned before, I read a lot of horror. And I read a lot of horror when I was young, and uh, I don't think it scarred me too much. <laughs> But, um, I, you know, I want the, the scene to be exciting, uh, and terrifying. And I, I kind of took cues from some movies that, uh, might be aimed a little bit more at, uh, adults, but definitely children enjoy, um, there are, there are terrifying scenes in, in Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's all they have but also the Lord of the Rings series, for example, and the the orcs and and stuff. They, uh, you know, there's some pretty scary stuff in there. So I think uh, I try to determine where I'm going to draw the line in terms of blood ah. being being the the big thing. So while there can be uh, uh, Attacks, and I don't want to go into too much detail about your, what you're going to read and, and spoil anything. Um, it's more situational terror. Something actually uh, happening to the character. And if something does actually happen to character, I try to, to minimize that. So I try to build the terror around just being in the situation. Yeah, it's very atmospheric and a lot of like tension, build up of tension. Yeah, and that that's interesting because I I took a, a back and there are a lot of those scary scenes in kids literature and and they kind of explain that that is to like kind of give kids a safe way to deal with these scary things that they're going to be dealing with in the real world. So it's kind of a an interesting dichotomy of making it safe enough for it to be accessible but scary enough to kind of mean something. <laughs> And I, I guess part of it also in this situation was, you know, they're they are going to be traveling into this mine that's abandoned. Um, and kids shouldn't be going into yeah. abandoned mine. So if I could do something that really puts that into their heads, like, this is a bad idea. Don't, Remember don't what happened to Alicia? Uh, then I've, I've done a little bit of good in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And speaking of children going into mines, this is based on a real mine. And and do you have experience yourself going into this mine? And <laughs> I do. You know, it's um, it's not active anymore. Uh, but uh, and hasn't been active in my entire lifetime. But um, when I was young, uh, it was just it was another interesting location that for me was always fascinating to see like this old band. Um, and as a child, my parents would take 
motorcycle rides and you can ride up there and, and see it. And, uh, you know, it was always a fun little getaway. Uh, as a um, person in my early 20s that was more into adventure <laughs> and exploring, I, th- I decided to go into the mine, uh, much to the delight of my parents. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, a very good friend and I went in, um, and we went into, there's a main opening, but it was, it was mostly boarded up, but some boards had fallen and we were able to get in, um, and go fairly. And I, I kind of describe everything that happens, not everything that happens, but, but what Alicia experiences as she's entering the mine, I experienced that as well. Um, so it was all written from my actual experiences in entering it. Um, and so after we went into the first area, it kind of dead ended and there wasn't, there wasn't far to go. So we searched around and found another opening kind of up on the hill. that was more of a cave in really, uh, which was Sounds safe. 10, times, <laughs> 10 times as dangerous as going into the, the front entrance, but we did it anyway. Um, we ended up coming back later because we needed a rope to go further because there was a hole in the hole inside the cave that went into the ground <laughs> to see what was down there. So we took a rope so we could go even deeper and, and uh, we, we got pretty far. I want to say um, it, w- it was a lot of up and down and climbing and moving around collapsed bits of, of earth and stuff, but probably a good hundred yards um, fully in at some point before uh, I finally uh, freaked out a little bit that <laughs> if something happens right now, we are we're really in a bad situation and it's probably best that we leave. And uh, so we did, but I definitely carry the memories of that and uh, <laughs> it was it's not something I would do again now yeah. but uh, from a safe was, distance they're highly entertaining very, knowing that you made it out already very fast. I love going on cave tours and there are several in um, the foothill valley that you can go on tours that are just kind of amazing but um, abandoned mines you shouldn't be exploring yeah Explore them in the book. Leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my my last question is: There's one thing that we meet in the mine. We we meet some leeches. Where did that come from? Do you have some some real life leech experience? I can't say I've ever. <laughs> I've been lucky enough not to meet any leeches so far. <laughs> are, yeah, I, I have. Um, oh no. And, uh, we used to have in the lake quite a bit of leeches. Um, if you were going to go swimming uh, anytime as a kid, anytime I went swimming and, you know, if I'm in the lake for an hour or whatever, getting out, there was always a quick arms and legs, parents look at your back, see if there's a leech on you, take it off. They're, these ones are small, they're not massive things. Um, but they never really freaked me out much as a child. Um, one time I stepped in a nest of them, I guess, oh. just a big collection. And when I came out, I had, I'm, I'm not kidding, probably 30 leeches on my leg. Mm. Oh. Uh, all, all very young ones, tiny ones, maybe half an inch in length or less. Um, and I just spent picking them all off, off my leg. Um, their bite, you can't feel it. Uh, it. Just the after effects, it feels like maybe a little bit more severe mosquito bite. Um, but you, you can't actually feel them when they're on you. Uh, and it's it's funny when I see in movies, they, they'll portray leashes in movies and uh, in particular the movie that I always think about when I think about it is uh, Stand By Me. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a scene when the kids are going wading through this swamp and they discover leeches and they freak out. Um, 
and for me, I was like, it's not really a freak out thing. I, and I guess just because I grew up with them there in the lake, um, it was never anything that I worried about. Um, but I believe the, their, uh, the population has been decimated by some uh, fairly recent um, fish addition to the lake. Oh boy. Perhaps ate them all because I haven't seen a leech in the lake for, I would guess, at least 15 years. Wow, well, who knew? <laughs> I feel kind of bad that the leeches are gone now. <laughs> I actually, I want to look for one just so I can show my wife, hey, this is, yeah. this is a real life leech, but... Uh, <laughs> I used to have uh, a bunch of these on my legs when I was a kid. <laughs> Thankfully not when the foot was burned. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? <laughs> Oh man, that is so interesting. Well, thank you for joining us again this week, Michael. You have the most fascinating stories about this stuff. You really did have an interesting free-range childhood. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the cabin is magical. It is still is a magical, magical place. And um, each summer was its own adventure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so fun getting uh, to share the magic with everybody now through the books. Yep. Great, well, thank you so much for joining us. And I guess we'll go ahead and uh, jump back into the book and let you get back to work. Uh, All right. Yeah. It's great Thanks very much. You, Michael. Okay, so as we mentioned last week, we met the ancient Vulcan and went to the Vulcan's hot springs. Vulcan was not able to help Alicia or give her any new advice, anything beyond what Thunderbolt had said, other than telling her she had some magic within her. So now, in her last ditch attempt, Alicia is going to find the third ancient, the Silver King, and see if he is going to be able to help her save her parents and her world. Okay, grab a little bit of water. So this is chapter 14 into darkness. Alicia and Tani spent the night in darkness. The frustrated teenager was in no mood to build a fire to provide light, but the moon was hovering in the sky and offered a soft white glow. Quickly, she turned on her flashlight to lay out a blanket and select food for her dinner. But for fear of the batteries going dead, she didn't keep the light on. Thank you for keeping me company, she said to the silent cougar. I know Thunderbolt sent you to watch out for me, but you could have done that from a distance. She let out a heavy sigh. Now you are the only real friend I have here. The great cat looked at the girl and gave no response, except for a slow blink, which Alicia took as a great sign. She doubted the cat would actually understand her words. Perhaps the magic she had did help her bond with the one end creatures. The sprites didn't show up that night. It could be that she had angered Vulcan by leaving in a huff, and so the being told them to leave the human be. Or maybe, as the ancient said, they just didn't play nicely with the cougar and chose to stay away. Alicia once again arranged her pack like a pillow and fell asleep listening to the sounds of Tawny breathing. The morning dawned quickly, warm and bright. Alicia awoke thinking about her encounter with Vulcan. She began to regret fleeing so quickly but the Ancient had said she had no magic to give, so why should Alicia waste her time? Standing and brushing her jeans, she grabbed a spear and tramped off into the nearby stream to fish. She wasn't hungry herself, but thought Tani might appreciate a fish for breakfast. She wanted to say thank you for not leaving during the night. Alicia knew the cat could hunt for herself, but in some way she felt her actions were a way of deepening their bond. She speared a river trout quickly and tossed it to Tawny, who had followed her the, to the river and now waited patiently nearby. The cougar devoured the fish quickly, taking large bites, and looked back at the girl as if to say, Is that all? Sorry, girl, you'll have to wait until later or find something for yourself. I'm running low on jerky, but I'm done fishing for now. Tawny looked at her a moment longer with that expressionless stare, revealing nothing about what she might be thinking before turning away and heading towards the stream to lap up the flowing water. Alicia retrieved her backpack. The trail was up here from her campsite and it would be a tiring trek. 
but she only had a few miles to go before reaching the mine where she assumed the king lived. The Eureka Silver King Mine had closed down many years ago, long before she was born. It was not the only mine in the area, but it was the closest. In her world, there was a gold mine 30 miles away near the small town of Yellow Pine. That mine was still active. Alicia had visited the rustic town once a few years ago, the harmonica festival they held there. I'll have to visit again, she thought. That is, if there's anything to go back to. Picking up her walking stick, Alicia continued her journey south. The mountain had finished drinking and followed after her, not quite keeping pace with the girl, but doing her own thing instead and wandering among the trees. Doing whatever large cats do, Alicia The girl trudged along, replaying the conversation with Vulcan in her head. She was still surprised to learn that the ancient knew of her mom and dad and that she had watched Alicia and her family without their knowledge, and continued to do so now with the sprites. Thinking about it gave her the creeps, and once again she had been told that she had magic, but nobody seemed to be able to tell her what that magic was or how to use it. Could she fly? That would be so cool. And it sure would have made this trek a lot easier. Alicia didn't really think she could fly or turn invisible or walk through walls, but who knew what powers she possessed? Maybe it was possible. After all, there might be a horse with a horn running around somewhere in this forest. If unicorns were real, then maybe flying humans could be real too. She laughed at the thought of a bunch of people flying around in the sky. Hey, Joe, where are you headed? Going out to pick some donuts for the office. How about you? Oh, my son forgot his homework at home, so, you know, I'm flying it over. Okay, see you later. Watch out for that. Ouch. Pigeon. <laughs> Alicia bellowed at the idea, causing Tawny to come closer to find out if there was anything. Seeing nothing threatening, the girl just making noises and holding her belly, the cat disappeared back into the forest to return to her exploration. Alicia's laughter improved her mood, as it always did. Feeling calmer, she returned to thinking about her magic. She still had no idea what it could be. The creatures kept referring to love as if it was some foreign thing, something they didn't understand. Could that be true? By using their powers, not for good, but to create the barrier that banished the human race, perhaps the ancient ones had banished love from the as well. She considered that idea, which didn't make sense to her, but maybe that was it. And maybe what the creatures saw as magic it was actually her ability to love and spread love to others. Alicia remembered how during her last trip to the wild side, her friends, the squirrel, the jay, the deer, were all drawn to her, even the mountain troll. They had all said it was because of the feelings of being a family, something they had never felt before. Maybe it was more than that. Not at first, of course, but that sense of love that they all had never experienced. Maybe that was the glue that bound them all together. She thought back to Grand Tree. In the end, he was filled with such emotion by her song that it overwhelmed him. Perhaps it was an emotion that he had never felt before, which is why it consumed him so completely. Could it really be as simple as that? Love? Could that be it? The idea seemed a bit silly to her at first, but the more she thought about it, the more it felt right. After all, when you give love, you get it in return. And her natural instinct of loving all all the creatures, something instilled in her at a young age by her parents, could have been all that her friends, and even Grand Tree, needed to feel. That special feeling of being loved allowed loving others to blossom within them. Had she planted the seed that bloomed inside them all? Alicia decided she liked that thought, and would hold on to that idea in the hopes that, in time, it would make the many mysteries she faced become clearer. With a lightened heart, she continued her journey to the final ancient. Alicia looked into the black maw of the cave and saw the remnants of minecart tracks built ages ago, which started a few feet inside and continued into the darkness. She had already made camp not far from the mine's entrance. It took her most of the day to reach this area, and she did not want to be stuck 
in the same situation as the night before. After her disappointing talk with Vulcan, it was already so late that she no longer had the time or energy to set everything up properly. So today, she chose to arrange rocks for a fire pit and found a place to leave her belongings before setting out to meet this ancient. Alicia supposed she could have waited until morning to meet the Silver King, but felt impatient after two false starts and was ready to be done with all of this. She brought only her flashlight and her walking with her into the cave. Dreading what may happen, she started into the inky darkness of the old mine. Water filled the floor of the tunnel, its glossy black surface making it impossible to tell how deep the ditch really was. The entrance was so small that she would have to crouch to enter or risk bumping her head on the weathered wood beam that supported the opening. Using her walking stick, Alicia poked the tip into the water, checking its depth. The stick sank only a couple of inches. Not bad, she thought. I can deal with having wet shoes for a bit. Looking into the cobweb-filled cave, she shivered. Alicia had never been squeamish about most bugs and other creepy crawlies. Even as a child, beetles with iridescent shells to bring home to her parents. Spiders, however, were another story. While not exactly fearful of the eight-legged creatures, she preferred to avoid them whenever possible. Peering into the gloom ahead of her, Alicia was barely able to make out the nooks and crannies that would be perfect hiding spots for them. She would have to be extra careful not to brush up against the walls as she walked, hunched over, into the depths of the mine. Okay, she said out loud, psyching herself up and settling her walking stick at her side. Let's get moving. Alicia stepped into the water, and after a second or two, felt the shockingly cold wetness penetrate her sock, instantly freezing her ankle to the bone. Tawny watched this disinterestedly from her resting spot in the dirt nearby, not deigning to get her paws wet. With her flashlight, Alicia shined it into the mine, but the dust-speckled beam was not strong enough to reach the end of the tunnel. Thankfully, the water was shallow, and she continued to move forward, her feet became numb with cold rather quickly. As she journeyed farther away from the opening, the light around her slowly dimmed. The sound of the woods from outside, a constant orchestra of noises, grew quieter and quieter, while the slosh, slosh of water swirling at her feet echoed off the narrow walls. The air felt clammy the farther she moved from the entrance, as the air became colder and mustier. The atmosphere was the exact opposite of her experience at Vulcan's Hot Springs. She could feel the hard metal of the minecart tracks against her feet and tried to avoid stepping on them for fear of slipping, staying centered between them as much as possible. There were thick wood pillars that reached from the floor to the ceiling, evenly spaced down the tunnels. In the evenings, while the family gathered around the fire, her grandfather would tell old stories about the mine. He had said that these columns supported the tunnel walls and kept them from collapsing. She hoped against hope that they were still strong enough to do that. Alicia was moving slowly and quietly, listening to the rhythmic sounds of the water splashing with each footfall through the flooded tunnel. It was much darker now as she glanced behind her. The entrance to the mine in the distance looked as though it had shrunk to the size of a quarter. And she could see the faint outline of Tani's head. and was watching her as she trudged away. Wow, I'm in here deep. Looking forward, she noticed what appeared to be a bend in the tunnel at the far reaches of her flashlight beam. Maybe she was close? Suddenly, Alicia's shoe caught on something underwater, perhaps a loose part of minecart track, and she stumbled forward. She quickly put out a hand to catch herself from falling, grabbing at one of the support logs on the wall. Her hand met what appeared to be a solid surface, but sank into the old log as if the wood was made out of a stick of butter left on the kitchen counter overnight. Centuries of water and time had aged softened the wood until there was nothing more than a pillar-shaped tower of rotten muck. Her hand sank all the way through the beam, finally coming to halt against the wall of the mine, stopping her fall. She straightened quickly and pulled her hand out of the muck. Fear crept into her mind as she realized the beams no longer supported the ceiling, that at any time, the roof could come crashing down on her head. Panic gripped Alicia's heart as she rinsed her muddy hand in the cold water around her feet. 
She wanted more than anything to flee the confines of this dark tunnel for safety of the outside world. But she knew she had to speak with the Silver King. Reluctantly, she struggled onward, further down the ancient mine shaft. Alicia reached behind, Alicia reached the bend in the tunnel and turned the corner. She paused, shining the light down this new corridor, but it looked much the same as the one she just left. And her light did not travel far enough for her to see the end. Though she knew it was safe, she continued on, determined to see this through. The thought of the roof collapsing and burying her forever made her less cautious than before. She hurried on more recklessly. She thought of Tawny waiting outside, not daring to enter the wet cave. Maybe now she understood part of the cat's unwillingness. Alicia noticed that the path she was on started descending on a downhill slope, causing the water to become deeper the farther she progressed. All source of light from the entrance had disappeared around the bend, and she could no longer hear any sounds but the echoes of water, which was now as high as her knees and rising with each step forward. Brr, this is really cold, she exclaimed out loud, and heard the words echo back to her. Cold, cold, cold. Those words sounded eerie and distorted, and brought with them their own chill, one that was sensed more than physically felt. Alicia decided to keep her thoughts inside her head for the time being. Speaking them out loud seemed to bring them to life. The water level had risen enough that Alicia now stood waist deep, requiring her to raise her arms to keep them dry and the flashlight safe. She felt something wriggle past and hoped it was one of the garter snakes that were common in these woods. They were not poisonous and certainly wanted nothing to do with the stranger invading their domain. Alicia took another step forward and had the sudden sensation of weightlessness as she felt empty space beneath her foot. She realized her error too late, letting fear guide her steps too quickly. There was some sort of hole in the cave floor ahead of her. Before she could, before she could react, she lost her balance, plunging forward until her head and body were completely submerged under the freezing water in this unknown place. Alicia thrashed frantically for a moment. She was a good swimmer, but the darkness and the cold disoriented her. A primal terror set in as she struggled to tell which way was up and how to reach safety. She didn't want to drown here in this abandoned mine, far from her world, far from her parents and friends. No one but the cougar knew where she was. She felt her lungs straining and feared this was the end. Suddenly, there was solid ground beneath her. Alicia planted her feet and, using all of her strength, pushed up forcing her head through the surface of the water. She saw nothing but blackness all around. The fall, in reality, was a trip that dropped her more, no more than a few feet beneath the blackness and had been disorienting enough to make it seem like much more. She was standing upright at the level the water was now, almost up to her neck. Worse than that, however, her flashlight went under too. She lifted it, feeling the water stream down its sides across her fingers. Her worst fear was confirmed. She had no light. The darkness enveloped Alicia so completely that she could not see her hand in front of her face. Bloom were a physical substance sticking to her eyeballs that could be cleared away. The cold claws of anxiety gripped her fiercely as she shook the flashlight, distressed by its inability to shine. She slapped it hard against her free hand, trying in vain to resuscitate it, to get more life out of the old batteries. There was a faint flicker, a hopeful spark, and then it was gone. No amount of beating the light was going to bring it back. Alicia stopped shaking the light, her shoulders sinking in despair. She stood alone in the dark, dank hole that she might never escape from. She breathed in short, sharp bursts, struggling to control fear as it welled inside her, but her involuntary gasps wouldn't stop. Calm, calm, she thought to herself, reaching for the strength to deal with the situation. She closed her eyes and continued to repeat the word like a mantra, mantra. Ever so slowly, her breathing returned to normal, and Alicia thought about her options. She could turn back now, should turn back now. She hadn't seen any branches on the tracks, so she could move slowly with extended hands to guide her until she found a bend. Once she turned that corner, she would be able to see the opening in the distance. She'd find her way out without the flashlight. Alicia was sure of it. 
But then what? She'd reached a dead end in her search for answers and needed help. She needed the Silver King. It was terrifying to consider, but she felt compelled to move forward. There was no other option. But what if there's another drop like the one I just had? Swimming through a black cave is not an idea she relished. On top of that, the water was so terribly cold. Squeezing her eyes even more tightly shut against the darkness, Alicia let out a scream of rage and frustration. The shout carried off into the distance, filling the mine with the sound echoing all around her. She stood there with her eyes closed, coming to terms with her next move. Eventually, Alicia reached her right hand up until it brushed the damp wall. Then she did the same with her left. If she stretched her arms and fingers as far as they could go, she could touch both walls at the same time. Okay, she spoke to herself. You can do this. Keep your hands brushing the walls on either side. If you feel an opening of any kind, a branching path, you need to turn around. It would be too easy to get lost in here. She would give herself a little more time to explore. In reality, she could always leave and return with some sort of torch. A long stick for I didn't know. Maybe her blanket if it came to that. Now that she was aware of the drop, she would be prepared for it and could lower herself over the edge, keeping the torch held high so it wouldn't get doused. With that plan in mind, Alicia opened her eyes, noticed a light. The faintest glow hovered on the very limits of her vision, floating high above her in the distance. She stared at the light, wondering if she imagined it. Could it be an after effect of closing her eyes so tightly? Or just an illusion that would fade in a moment? She continued to focus on it, trying to let her eyes adjust. But when the light didn't fade, a spark of hope lit within her. Alicia pushed forward, more carefully now that she had no flashlight, but with renewed urgency. Fighting the chest high water, the dim light ahead grew increasingly brighter as she progressed, reflecting off the water and flashing onto the wet walls that surrounded her. She kept her arms extended, her fingers carving small grooves in the mud of the walls. After several more yards, she could feel the ground rising under her feet each step taking her into shallower water. With a great heave of her sodden shoes, and a last, she at last took a squelching step out of the water. She could see the ground ahead of her slope upward, towards and through the ceiling. It appeared that a mine collapse had occurred here at some time in the past, raining down dirt and debris, which had formed a huge mound in front of her, creating a climbable hill. She could see the opening above, belonging to another passage, and through the hole, a large chamber was barely visible, obviously the source of light. Alicia clambered up the slope, using her hands to dig in and pull herself higher, eager to get away from the water and the darkness below. The light grew brighter. With a final lunge, she pulled herself into the new passage. Alicia rested on her hands and knees for a moment, catching her breath. When she raised her head, she froze in disbelief about what she saw. The room before her was massive enough to be the size of a small movie theater. The ceiling stood so far above, it was almost lost in the darkness. Despite the grandeur of the room, her eyes were drawn to what stood in front of her. It was an enormous deposit of silver, polished and glinting, a small mountain of it, here within this room. Alicia slowly stood, studying the great mound of metal. The silver had a smooth, blobby, amorphous look as if something huge, a mountain troll perhaps, had taken giant utensils and dipped heaping spoonfuls of mercury, one after another, each clump freezing in place where it had landed. The drops formed a hollow in the middle, a depression in the shape of a large chair or throne. And on the throne sat the, sat the statue man, carved from dirt and mud. Hello, my dear, the statue said. Welcome to my domain. Come closer. As she watched, surprise plastered across her face. The mud man sat forward and raised an arm beckoning. Alicia realized that she stood in the presence of the Silver King. So now we get to see the third ancient Silver King. Let's see, I think we have enough time for one more chapter. So we'll read chapter 15, The Silver King. 
Alicia stumbled forward, staring at the ancient before her, a being of mud and decay. He had been the most powerful of all the beings in this realm before they used their terrible power to sever the worlds. She walked hesitantly towards the throne. As she approached, her eyes scanned the magnificent room around her. What appeared to be black vines, some type of cave moss, hung from the ceiling, like strands of wet hair. The air was heavy with the smell of dirt, not the pleasant aroma of wet earth after rain, but the sour stench of rot and mud. Alicia could see tiny cracks in the roof of the chamber, where small rays of sunlight filtered in, glinting off the silver throne, reflecting crazily in different directions. This was the source of the light she had seen earlier. While not enough to completely banish the darkness, it was bright enough to allow her to see the dark features of the king. It has been an age since someone visited me here. His voice was wet and phlegmy, like gases rising through a swamp, only to burst in the air and release their words. And there have been so many humans in this realm since someone had come to be here. Alicia looked in amazement at this being, so primeval. He was larger than a normal man. His body, formed from the earth, was clearly not defined. It appeared as if some as if time had done to him exactly what it had done to the sodden wooden pillars in the passage. His features drooped slightly as he spoke. She wondered if her hand would sink into his skin as well if she touched him. Hello, sir, um, your majesty? Uh, she fumbled, not knowing what to call him. Come now, there's no need for formalities. He burped muddily back at her, settling into his massive chair. Tell me your name. Tell me what is it happening in the world above. She struggled to pull herself together, feeling wet and dirty, not worthy of standing in the presence of a king, regardless of his slumped appearance. It's a bit of a long story, sir, she began. My name is Alicia. I came to this world three years ago. Well, 4,000 years ago in your time. I don't quite understand how, but the other ancient ancients say they called me. The Silver King made a disgusting sound with his lips. Those two, he said, continuing to disturb the balance after everything we did. I know, the girl blurted out, immediately feeling embarrassed by her outburst. I know, she repeated in a softer tone. I said the same thing. I mean, I sort of understand their reasons trying to defeat Grantree and all. Grantree? The King interrupted with a question. You don't know about Grantree? Alicia was perplexed. Wait, after you created the barrier, re you returned here and never left this mine? The underworld is my home, even after your kind destroyed this mountain. Anger filled his voice, and with it, a low rumble reverberated through the ground under Alicia's feet. She threw out her hands to keep her balance, seeing the vines swaying above her head. She was fearful of a possible cave-in. This mine remains my home, and I have no need to leave. The rumble diminished, but Alicia could sense that the Earth being had power, more power than the other two ancients. A thought which gave her hope. The grand tree is a great yellow pine, bigger than any tree before. You actually had a hand in creating it. I did nothing of the sort, the Silver King argued. What makes you think I had anything to do with that? Those others? He spat the word as if he had tasted something foul. Tell you that I did something? Alicia didn't want to anger the king any more than she already had, but she pushed on. When you created the barrier, there was a seed unseen by any of you. That pine seed absorbed some of your strength and some from all three of you. It wasn't your fault exactly, she said, trying to take some of the sting out of her words. But that's, the, that seed grew into a great tree that stood as high as the heavens. The tree almost destroyed this realm with its desire to become bigger and stronger. <laughs> it sucked most of the water from the land. I remember my tunnels growing drier, the old king said, but that was long ago. Yes, she agreed. It was over 4,000 years in your time. Alicia could not stop herself from sharing the story Th Thunderbolt had shared. Thunderbolt and Vulcan said they gave me the power to defeat Grantree. They also said 
I had power within me. She felt her heart beating in her throat and swallowed, hoping to push it back where it belonged. I don't know if that's the same thing or something greater, but I found the tree, I spoke to him, I sang to him, and in the end he gave back all that he had stolen from the lands. She caught her breath and felt a smile grow on her face. She was hopeful now that this ancient might actually be able to help her. You do have power in you, the Silver King said, a note of eagerness creeping into his voice. He leaned forward once again, examining the girl. I can sense it now, something I haven't felt in a long time. Vibrations stirred through the earth again, smaller than before, but noticeable. I was able to cross back. Oh, sorry. I was able to cross back. I don't know how it seemed fine, Alicia continued. And now, three years later in my world, there are cracks appearing in the barrier between our realms. She had to make sure the Silver King understood the severity of the situation she faced. The flow of time from the two sides is conflicting somehow, creating these bubbles of frozen time. My, my parents are trapped in one. I have come here because I need your help. She furrowed her brow, replaced the smile from only moments ago while sharing the truth about her parents' situation. The Silver King looked her up and down. She felt self-conscious about her appearance, knowing she must resemble a drowned rat, and avoided his gaze. I thought I felt a shifting, a tremor, oh. I thought I felt a shifting, a tremor of creation, he said. I didn't know that it could be, I didn't know what it could be. I have little concern anymore for the events in the world above. I left that world after the severing of the realms. The king looked back at his throne. Alicia watched the being made of mud. So much time I've been waiting down here in the dark, with only my pets for company, he contemplated, waiting for my energy to return, knowing nothing of what happens up there. He gestured to the ceiling with his eyes. Did you know this mine used to be bustling with activity? Remembering back to happier times. There were men coming and going all the day and night. They would talk to me here in the dark, tell me stories and give me gifts of silver. I ruled over it all. The king's voice turned sour. But you humans were greedy and the gifts stopped coming. You started to take and take, never giving. You took all my beloved silver. We had to create a barrier to protect what was ours. The king leaned forward again. Staring intently at Alicia, she could see herself in his eye. That creation sapped me of my strength, so now I live here, alone, down in the dark with the bugs and the snakes, never knowing what became of the world of light. He snarled wetly, accusingly, as he spoke of, and the rumbling came and went again. Alicia looked at the king apprehensively. Does that mean you can't help me? She asked, fearing the answer. My power has come back slowly, ever so slowly, he replied, leaning back against the throne once again. What I have sustains me now. Why should I use it to help you, a human? If I were to help you, what would become of me? Why should I care about your world or your family? He looked down at the girl in front of him. If I were to help you, what would you give me in return? Alicia held her arms out to her sides, palms forward. In one hand, she held the useless flashlight. The other was empty. I have nothing to give, sir, she replied. The sorrow in her voice echoed the helplessness in her heart. Oh, but you do, the king said, a muddy smile slowly growing on his face. I do sense a power hidden in you, my dear but it seems buried, hidden. I don't feel the power, she said dejectedly. I'm as useless as this flashlight now. She held up the dead flashlight, looking past the ancient. Her hopeful glow extinguished as light stick in her hand. Maybe I can do something to help you release it, the Silver King said, a renewed desire in his voice. Maybe if I do that, you can share your power with me. 
His voice rose, growing louder in the large chamber. Or maybe I can take it for myself. Alicia didn't like those words or the tone that crept into the being's voice. She took a step back from the king, creating distance between the two of them. My pets will feed well tonight, he whispered and snapped his fingers with a wet squelch. The vibrations returned to the earth, growing stronger, throwing the girl off balance. What are you doing? She cried. Stop, please. The vibrations returned. Oh, uh, she, the vibrations continued and Alicia noticed movement out of the corner of her eye. Glancing up, she saw that hang the hanging vines appeared more active than when she had entered the cave, as if a strong wind was blowing across their surface, causing them to ripple like a field of wheat turned upside down. She watched one of the vines as one of the vines fell, knocked loose by the rumbling that filled the cavern. It landed on the ground in front of her, and to her utter surprise began undulating towards her. It was black and shiny and moist as it moved towards her. It stretched and retracted, stretched and retracted, propelling itself forward with each movement like a monstrous caterpillar. Alicia squinted in the dim light and looked closer at the thing approaching her. With horror, she realized what she had mistaken for cave vines in the dark was something much more terrible and frightening. Leeches. They began dropping one after another from the wet ceiling, thousands of them. Alicia backed slowly away from the Silver King, her eyes darting left and right as more of the leeches detached themselves from the ceiling, coming down like the darkest rain imaginable. Why are you doing this? She screamed at the king. She felt something hit her in the head and reached up to find one of the large creatures squirming through her hair, searching for her scalp. She pulled it from her head and stared as it writhed frantically in her fingers. The leech looked fat, black, like a fat black earthworm, except for both ends, which had suckers for tips. The end closest to her, the head, had the largest sucker, and she could see a small hole in the middle. That was the mouth, where the needle-like probesis would extend and draw blood from her scalp. She screamed and flung the horrible creature as far as she could. Another disgusting of the disgusting worms landed on her neck and immediately sank its mouth parts into her skin, piercing the flesh and, fleece and feasting on her warm, delicious blood. Alicia reached back and grasped the squirming thing which was slippery and covered in mucus and it continued to suck unsuccessfully as she unsuccessfully tried to grip it. Finally, she slid the ragged a ragged fingernail between the mouthpiece of the leech and her skin, prying it away and feeling the line of blood run down the back of her neck. She threw the thing into the ground at her feet, stomping on it and feeling a satisfying squish. The Silver King watched and laughed, his voice filled with malevolence. Don't worry, my dear. They're small and don't eat much. But there are so many, and we are so hungry. They will give me your power. His evil laughter continued to echo around the cavern. Alicia turned and fled, plunging blindly down the steep slope into the chamber below. She lost her footing and tumbled head over heels until she landed with a splash in the water. The darkness of the mine passage wrapped her in its heavy weight as she began, as she left behind the dim light of the audience chamber, the king and his foul pets. The water in the tunnel immediately soaked her, and she felt the icy cold like razors on her skin. The deep water slowed her progress, but she pushed forward as hard as she could, hearing the slipping sound of thousands of leeches trailing her closely. Plopping into the water behind her, only searching for the girl, sensing the warmth of her body, and craving the blood pumping within. Get her! She heard the Silver King scream from behind her. The tunnel rumbled violently around her, the muddy water splashing into her eyes. Feed! Feed! Release the magic! Give it to me! The leeches, faster now than they were in the water, now that they were in the water, stretched their rubbery bodies to full length and undulated through the dark like small eels. They piled into the water behind her, sensing her movements up ahead, with almost invisible hair-like protrusions that covered their bodies. Alicia continued her flight, her arms outstretched ahead of her in the blackness of the old mine. She tried to pick up her feet as much as possible with each step, because she knew if she tripped and went down now, the hungry creatures would be all over her in a heartbeat, biting, sucking, draining her of her life-sustaining blood. In the deep water of this tunnel, the leeches moved more quickly than she could, and Alicia was losing her head start, the head start she had gained in her initial burst of speed as she tumbled down the hill. 
She knew that if she could not get to the bend in the tunnel, the water would grow shallower, and she would be able to see the light at the entrance for guidance. Alicia felt a ring on her left ankle, followed by the stab of a leech attaching itself there. They had reached her. Seconds later, she felt another stab alongside the first. Alicia fought harder to move forward, pulling all the energy she had left from deep inside of her, feeling a third stab on her right ankle, and then a fourth on her, the back of her arm. She started to lose count, and terror consumed her as more and more leeches found her bare skin and began to feed. Ignoring the grotesque worms dangling from her skin, Alicia kept her arms outstretched in front of her, periodically to her left and right to help guide her by feeling for the walls. Her knee collided with the edge where she had fallen off before, sending a strong jolt of pain, racing up her leg. Doing her best to ignore it, she scrambled up the small ledge, and the water dropped away to her waist. She could move more rapidly now, still slower than she wanted. She knew where the bend up ahead was, not too much farther. That knowledge gave her hope. Feeling another leech swimming up her pant leg and attaching its sucker-like mouth to her skin, Alicia knew she still wasn't safe and slogged forward as hard as she could. Her breath came in huge, huge gasps as she gradually made her way up the slope, feeling the water becoming shallower. Suddenly, her outstretched hands sunk into the muddy wall ahead of her. She turned left towards the main entrance and escape. Far in the distance, she could see the opening of the mine. The light it had provided earlier was less, less pronounced. How long had she been in the cavern? Night was falling, which made the light in the passage dim. The water was only ankle deep at this point, and she ran forward towards the entrance, caution thrown to the wind her legs drinking and swelling with her blood, their middle sections becoming round, as if they were small, disgusting balloons slowly inflating with air. Darker and darker the tunnel became as she raced to exit, trying desperately to outrun the setting of the sun. The mud on the floor sucked at her shoes with each step, but still she ran. No longer heard the cruel, hungry laughter of the Silver King, but the underground tremors continued. She knew that if she slowed, the pursuing leeches could burst from the mine entrance and saw Tani there, first looking questioning at her and then looking back with alarm towards the tunnel to see what chased her. Alicia just kept running, leaving the great cat, no choice but to follow. She needed to put as much distance as possible between her, the mine, and the dark horrors that hid there. Bum, bum, bum. So now we met Silver King and what a jerk he was. <laughs> But Alicia has escaped for now, and next week we'll see what happens to Alicia and Tani now that they're being chased by leeches. <laughs> well, we hope you have enjoyed this week. I hope you will join us again next Wednesday. And also, if you're enjoying these, make sure to share them with a friend and like and subscribe so you'll, you'll get notifications about episodes in the future. Thanks so much for joining us.